we're really excited to bring out our next two guests. Uh, we have uh, John Dor and Ryan Pinchatsaram joining us uh, on stage. Uh, John is the chairman of VC firm Kleiner Perkins and author of multiple books, most recently Speed and Scale, An Action Plan for Solving Our Climate Crisis Now, which hopefully you all received a copy of when you registered. Um, so we hope you all uh, enjoy that. Uh, he's one of the top tech venture capitalists in the world, led early investments in companies like Google, Amazon, DoorDash, and Slack. He's also the co-founder of New Schools Venture Fund, focused on education reform and charter schools, and a fierce advocate of clean energy technology. Um, and he's going to be joined on stage by Giant Pincha Ryan Panchatsaram, who's uh, an advisor to the chairman at Kleiner Perkins and was a co-writer of Speed and Scale. Um, he was previously the deputy chief technology officer to the White House uh, and has worked at Salesforce and Microsoft um, and studied engineering and operations research at UC Berkeley. Uh, we're really excited to have them both here. So here to discuss their book and actions to take leadership on climate change, please welcome John and Ryan. Hi. This looks delicious. I wish we had food, John. <laughs> Did you say something? I, I said I wish we had food as well, too. It looks quite delicious out there. What a great group. What a packed conference. This is the largest ever, right? Let's give it up for ASU and GSV. So, John. We're here to talk about a lot of things, from goal setting to the climate crisis. But I first want to start with your history and education. How do you describe your relationship to learning? So I, I'm an engineer, uh, eldest of five kids from a middle class family in Missouri, St. Louis. And growing up, my mom, yeah, let, OK, let's give it up for Missouri. <laughs> Growing up, my mom and dad said to all of the kids, uh, we're going to treat you all equally, and you're going to get exactly the same thing, which is a good education, because no one can take that away from you. And what you do with it is what's going to matter. I'll say along the way, they also gave us good middle class values. Uh, and so I'm, I'm a lucky, red-blooded, patriotic, proud American who has had the chance of a lifetime to work with innovators, entrepreneurs, and disruptors in changing the world. Uh, I, I, I went on a journey of discovery with Kim Smith and Brooke Byers 20 years ago, and that was in search for what we called education entrepreneurs. Everybody was glorifying all the technology entrepreneurs, and. The, the truth is, they don't deserve as much credit as they get, though they, they, they do deserve some. They had Moore's Law working for them all the time. If your fundamental ingredient gets cut in half in its cost every two years, you ought to be able to make a big business about it. But the second largest, most screwed up part of our great nation is our public education system. And it deserves all the innovation, all the leadership, all the resources that we can devote to it. And so that's where my journey began. You started your career at Intel, where you received the gospel of OKRs, objectives and key results. What are OKRs and why are they important? OK, show of hands. Who knows what an OKR is? Well, that's a, good group. a lot of people know. Now, how many people use OKRs for operational access? This is really gratifying. If Andy Grove was with us, he'd be smiling. For those of you who don't know, an OKR stands for an objective and key result. And Grove was a 20-year-old Hungarian emigre when he came to New York, one of 200,000 emigres from Hungary, from fascism, penniless, speaking very little English. He studied chemical engineering at City University in New York then went to get a PhD in chemical engineering at Berkeley, then somehow connected with the founders of Fairchild and was a technology director there. Well, Andy became the CEO of Intel. That's where I first met him, and I immediately adopted him as a mentor. 
And, and he had the toughest job in the world, which is to try to get 10,000 people to get lines a millionth of a meter wide exactly right, or nothing would work at all. That's the chip making business. Not as, well, I won't make further comparisons. He concluded that the way to do that was to empower everybody in a rigorous, bold, accountable system that would cause people to be focused and aligned and stretching to do nearly impossible things. These were OKRs. And I went to Intel University, saw him give this course. When I left Intel five or so years later, I took Andy's slides with me, and anywhere I could get an audience to listen, I would give them Andy Grove's gospel according to OKRs, goal setting. And I did this for some startups, a particular startup, the Gates Foundation, when they were getting going. Uh, Bono and his crusade to end transmission of HIV AIDS. Uh, and uh, a couple of PhD computer science dropouts from Stanford at Google, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. I took them through his course and at the end of it asked, so what do you think, guys? Would you use this or not? The room went silent. Larry Page didn't have any answer for me whatsoever. He was notably brilliant and introverted. But Sergey Brin, the brilliant Russian emigre, said, well, John, we don't have any better way to manage Google, so we'll give this a try. <laughs> and I took that as a ringing endorsement. Here's why. Every quarter since then, every Googler has written down her objectives and key results, 150,000 of them and publish them on an internal website. This action plan has never leaked. And every quarter, they're graded by the contributor, shared with the rest of the company, and then they're tossed away because they're not used for promotions or for pay increases. They serve a higher purpose. That's to get collective alignment around what matters. So Ryan and I, after authoring a book on OKRs called Measure What Matters, said, what would happen if we applied Andy Grove's goal setting system to the biggest challenge of our lifetime, to the existential threat for the kids that you're guiding and care for, the climate crisis? And uh, we, we set out to, to do that, not so much to write a book. This book that you received is not a book, it's actually a plan. It's an action plan in OKR format for dealing with the climate crisis. And John, with, uh, you know, OKRs play a big part of the book. And for most of the hands that went up in the room, for the hands that didn't go up, why should an organization adopt OKRs? What superpowers do you get? There's five payoffs for OKRs. The first, it'll focus your team. The second, it will make them aligned because if you're going to do anything of consequence, it takes more than an individual, it takes a team. Focus, alignment. You'll gain greater commitment. It's far more effective for me to decide I'm going to run a marathon to be healthy than it is to run a marathon because someone told me. So you get to choose your commitment. Then, with this focused, aligned, committed set of goals, you can track your progress. Mm -hmm tell if you're falling behind or if you're on track. And then finally, you can stretch. Uh, Larry Page, who wrote a foreword for the first book, said, you know, John, I'd rather have a team aim for Mars and know 70% of the time they'll get there. And if they fall short, they'll still make it to the moon. So the moonshot 10x stretch culture may be right for your organization. It's not right for everyone. But I want to say that any organization that's succeeded with OKRs has always adapted them. They've not just adopted them, but they've tuned them up for your values, your culture, your team. I want us to talk about speed and scale in a second, but I want to get a secret from you, which is some investing tips. From Intel, you went to Kleiner Perkins, where you became the original investor in Google, in Amazon, Coursera, and scores of other companies. What traits do successful founders share? That's a really great question. And you know, about a decade ago, we did a survey. We looked back on the super successful 
ventures compared to the ones that were just, just good, and of course, those that failed. Five factors distinguished the super successful entrepreneurs and ventures. One, technical excellence. Two, outstanding management. Three, strategic focus on a large and unserved market need. Fourth, uh, reasonable financings. Ventures, nonprofits, or for profits can raise too much money as well as too little. And then the fifth, the advantage for any of these superstar ventures was a sense of urgency. Now, very few organizations possess all five of those, and they don't possess them in equal measure. So the judgment we're trying to make as a, a, a team of supportive venture investors is, how many of these are in place? How self-aware are the team and the founder or the ones they want to add? Do they have a commitment to build a world-class team? But those five factors make all the difference. So we wrote Speed and Scale, and for me, my journey into climate started five years ago when I started working with you. But your journey into climate started almost two decades ago. Could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I first want to survey our amazing audience here. How many of you saw Al Gore's original Inconvenient Truth? Show of hands. And do you remember what it was like after you saw that, after you talked with people about it? I want to tell you some numbers. Eight million people watched that movie, a movie about a slideshow, which won an Academy Award, which won a Nobel Peace Prize. And the most influential, Al told me, of the people who saw that were the teachers. More teachers around the world put the climate crisis on their agenda as a priority for a very powerful reason. The climate crisis is not an option for your students, for our youth. It is their future. It's existential. And so my introduction to it was the same as yours. I saw Al Gore's movie, and I went home to have dinner with my family and some friends who saw it with me. We went round the table to ask what people thought about it. When the conversation came to my 16-year-old daughter, Mary, here's what she did. She looked straight at me, and she said, Dad, I'm scared and I'm angry. Your generation created this problem. You better fix it. And the room, friends, went silent. I had no idea what to say. I had no idea what was involved in this climate crisis. So I set out with my partners at Kleiner Perkins to travel the world, to go to labs in, in China, the Mojave Desert, to the Brazilian rainforest, uh, to try to understand what forces were at work, what was going on. We began investing in this field slowly at first, over three funds and maybe eight or so years. We put about a billion dollars in 70 different start climate startups, most of which failed, and it looked really rough. We learned a lot of lessons along that way. But we stayed the course, and I'm pleased to report that today that billion dollars is worth some three billion dollars, even more important than those hard-fought returns on investment were the progress that was made by companies like Enphase or Nest or Beyond Meat, many of which are profiled in this book. I call that Climate 1.0. I made one horrible investment mistake, which was to back Fisker instead of Tesla. <laughs> but I rejoice in the success that Tesla has achieved. They've not yet affected climate, carbon, in a meaningful way. But boy, have they put a sense of urgency in the worldwide automobile industry to electrify transportation, which is a, such an important goal. And along the way, it's the seventh most valuable company in the world, Value, as valuable as its next four competitors combined. So go Tesla, <laughs> go innovators. That's my story. So we're going to dig into the plan. We've got a few slides that we're going to uh, walk through. The first, aha, John, what's the plan? The plan, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> the plan is total system transformation. What do you mean by that, John? I thought you might ask. <laughs> Remember these numbers. 59, net zero, in 2050. 
We're tossing 59 gigatons of carbon pollution into our atmosphere as if it's some kind of free and open sewer every year. We've got to take that 59 gigatons of emissions to a net of zero by 2050, and importantly, halfway there by 2030 in the next eight years, to have a reasonable chance, the science tells us, of having a survivable, habitable planet where the rise in temperature is limited to 2.1 degrees Fahrenheit, sorry, Celsius, mm -hmm. over pre-industrial eras. 59 gigatons, net zero, 2050. And so, this is the plan. It's six wonderful, big, hairy, audacious objectives. Can I tell you about them? Yeah, let's do it. Next slide, please. Aha. Uh -huh. I digress. In March of 1942, FDR called into his office General Hap Walker. This was six months after the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. The Western effort to defeat Hitler was not going so well. Hap Walker asked the president, what's the plan? He pulled out a napkin this napkin, and he wrote this. He said, it's to attack Japan proper, to attack France, and hold our positions in four other territories. It was clear, it was simple, it was measurable, and it inspired the forces, not just the military forces, but the manufacturing forces of the West to defeat an existential threat. So what's the plan for the climate crisis? We were inspired by that. And it's to get to net zero by 2050 by attacking six major sources of emissions. Electrify transportation, decarbonize the grid, fix our food system, protect nature, stop deforestation, stop trawling of oceans, clean up industry, how we make cement and concrete. And when we're done with those first five, remove the remaining stubborn carbon that's left in the atmosphere. Each one of these is a big objective, a world all unto its own. And the first five, it turns out, add up to 49 gigatons per year by 2050. There's still 10 gigatons remaining. And so today, the IPCC issued its third report on the technological and natural solutions, the behavioral solutions we need to get to net zero. And they said, we must find ways to remove carbon. Our plan calls for 10 gigatons to be removed through more forestation and mechanical trees, solutions like direct air capture. I wanna warn you, this is a scary story because we do not know how to do that today at scale economically. And so the, uh, in writing the plan, right, that napkin forced us in the book writing and the OKR process to be concise, but really to fit it on a napkin, by the way. You can't put too much on it. And so when the first part, the top, which are these six, get us from 59 to zero, but it might take us the full century to get there. And so the question we pose to the team, and by the way, our team is some of the best experts all around the world, right? We got the luxury of calling anybody up to say, how do we do this? and how do we do it faster? And so the second part of the book are the accelerants. And it's everything from winning the policy and politics. So when you see a commitment being made at Glasgow, right, it's turning that into real action at home. It's about turning movements into action. So from the ballot box to the corporate boardroom. It's also innovating, right? When you look at the key results around innovation, they're all around cost, right? Anything that we invent, it has to be approachable to the masses. And for that to be true, it's got to cost uh, less than the fossil fuel equivalent. And then the fourth lever we have is investment. We have to invest like our lives depend on it because they do, right? The transition according to the IEA is going to cost some $4 trillion a year. And most of it actually is just by spending it on the cleaner, greener thing. And then we have to, of course, invest in new companies and more project financing as well to deploy, deploy the solar and wind that we need. 
Ryan, what do you think is the hardest part of this plan? Ooh. I, for, for me, the hardest part of the plan is actually the movements into action piece, but it's the place that actually I think has the most hope, right? If you think in the United States, climate as an issue, it's not a top issue, right? A top voting issue. But once you make it, right, the policy and politics flow. But John, I'll throw that question back to you. What do you think is the hardest issue? I used to think the hardest thing was to get the publisher to put the plan in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and I do want to... Uh, interrupt our conversation to make sure that everybody in the viewing audience knows they can go to speedandscale.com now and download this plan for free. You can print it out on legal paper or larger paper. And what makes the plan different than a set of goals are Andy Grove's key results. So if you turn to the backside, for every one of these big hairy ass objectives, there are three to five specific time-bound measurable key results that will allow us to track our progress. You'd expect nothing less from an engineer, right? Well, that's, that's what you've got here. On our first objective of electrifying transportation, we're gonna reduce eight gigatons of emissions from light vehicles and trucks to two gigatons by 2050. And you'll see that there are six measurable key results. I'll just call out one or two of them. To get that done, we're gonna to have to get electric vehicles to be price performance parity with internal combustion engines in the US by 2024. That means their price has gotta get down to $35,000. It's in the 50s right now. And in India and China, remember this is a global plan, we've gotta to get to price parity by 2030 at $11,000 a vehicle. And that's just one of six key results. Here's another one. This is the killer one. You can put all the new cars on the road you want, John. What really matters is the miles driven. And so key result 1.4 says 50% of the miles driven by all vehicles, two-wheelers, three-wheelers, cars, buses, and trucks, must be electric by 2040, and 95% by 2050, or we will not achieve this plan. And that story is told again and again and again across 10 objectives, 55 time-bound measurable key results. Now, lest this overwhelm you as being daunting, many people have just said, I'm gonna stay away from this issue. It's so overwhelming, I can't understand it. I'm not here to tell you today this is the only plan, or even it's the best one, but it's a plan where the numbers add up and they're backed by experts. And it's a plan where there's a role for you in your leadership position to move your schools, our societies, our communities forward in achieving the plan. So I invite you to go to speedandscale.com, download this plan. I wanna recruit you obviously to this, this campaign, this mission that's so important. We invested so much time in these KRs because they show you where the gigatons are, right? You know, you think about our communities, you think about our kids, and where they're focusing their energies. And we kind of want to give them a cheat sheet, right? Rather than protest about this part of the puzzle, why not actually go for where the gigatons are? And so those six first solutions show you where those are. And then the four accelerants are where you can make this stuff happen faster, right? And so if you take a peek here at KRs for turning movements into action, well, we know we have the wind behind our backs if voters believe this is an important issue. You know, John, you're really fiery about Greta and the work and the amazing work that she's done. Why is what she is doing so important? Look, in 2018, Greta Thunberg was a lone Swede protesting, striking from school on Fridays in front of the Swedish parliament. A year later, by December of 2019, she'd sparked a revolution. A million youth turned out in 100 cities to protest climate change. And I'm a strong advocate for civil disobedience on this most vital of all issues. Setting that aside, the movements must be more than protests. They must be translated into action. And here's what Greta did. If you look at key result 8.1, it's that the climate crisis become a top two voting issue in the top 20 countries around the world. Global plan again, global key results. Well, Greta's efforts measurably made climate a top two voting issue in seven European nations seven European nations. 
But climate is not a top two issue in the United States of America. It is not a top two voting issue in China. It is not a top two voting issue in India. We've got to go for the gigatons. We've got to go to the communities, the nations, the organizations in the world that are emitting the most carbon. And so that's going to be one of the most important of all our key results. Education figures prominently throughout this plan, unsurprising to you, but importantly for our getting to a solution. The plan also calls for education equity. Key result 8.4 may surprise you. It says that the world must achieve universal primary and secondary education by 2040. Global plan. John, what are you doing talking about global education? Well, there is no greater contributor to health, prosperity, and climate than to have, yeah, this is about girls' education globally, universal primary and secondary education. The climate crisis is a great amplifier of inequality. And so social justice, economic and climate justice is a vital part of building sustainable support for the systemic kind of transformations that we're going to need. This transition to a new clean energy economy is what uh, Lorene Powell, Job call, Powell Jobs calls in the last interview in the book, the greatest gift potentially to humankind that we've ever received. That is an existential global challenge to build a new clean energy world. The, uh, the, there's one way you can view this crisis, which is one that paralyzes you. And our hope through this book is that it galvanizes you and actually shows you the actions that you need to take aren't as complex as they look and the solutions that you can actually go after can actually get us halfway there by 2030, right, to create that momentum. But, you know, sometimes you'll hear that saying, we have all the solutions we need or we don't. And so, John, as an innovator and an investor, do we have all the solutions we need? We have enough solutions to get to 50% reduction in emissions by 2030. I want to do some compound Rice University math with you here for just a moment. With a growing world, growing economic activity, the science and arithmetic shows us that to get to a 50% reduction by 2030, we need to reduce carbon emissions 8% per year, every year compounded this year, in 2023, in 2024, 25. How many people show of hands, think that we'll reduce carbon emissions by 8% in the next year. How about two years from now? How many believe we'll get this job done, 50% reduction by 2030? Show of hands, please. It's just me and one person out there, John. And a few more here. <laughs> this is not an option. We do not have in place today the plans or the political will to get this job done. That's why I think it's so important that the book wasn't written to persuade you the climate crisis is a crisis. We're not trying to persuade you to go vegan. We're out of time for that. Individual actions are expected and necessary, but they won't get us to where we're going to go. So what can this community do, John, to tackle this climate crisis? Well, I'm inspired by Jim Collins, who wrote Good to Great. Jim, in his most recent book, defined leadership as the art of getting others to want to do what must be done. And so Ryan and I wrote this book for the leader in every walk of life. It's not to convince people to go vegan. It's not to convince you to put solar panels on your roofs or to buy an electric vehicle. It's to examine critically your personal power, your magic, and use your leadership to get collective action from others. For example, the book, which is written by an engineer, I'll confess to that, 
also includes stories that are memorable of 30 individuals. It's the heart that goes with this book. It's not just for your head. And it tells the story of a cross-country track team in Virginia who grew tired of running beyond and behind the polluting diesel school buses. And they convinced their school to go to electric buses. Or the whole district in Maryland that got the fleet of diesel polluting school buses made electric buses with great advantages for health, for economics, for pollution. And these buses even plug into the grid and their batteries when renewables aren't performing. There's two and a half billion dollars in the infrastructure bill to fund school buses. Does your school district have electric school buses? Could you play a role in changing that? Could you change the cafeteria menu at your school? Not to eliminate beef, but just to have it half as often. Because we've got to do that to get to where we need to go with our plan. Can you mobilize your community and educate them? Another thing I think a, a teacher or a leader can readily do is sign up for the Climate Reality Academy that Al Gore has sponsored, which puts in the hands of climate leaders who care about this all the tools they need to teach or organize or persuade people in a community about action that can be taken for the climate crisis. Most of all, I invite you to come to this website, speedandscale.com. Read the book critically. This is just the first edition. We're going to reissue this every couple of years with updates. I want to do a better job with it. I want to create an Indian version of it, a Chinese partner version of the campaign. Uh, it's, um, it's the most important work, could be the most important work of our lives. Well, what's special about that message is it's expected we do those things in our personal life, right? The electric vehicle, trying to switch to the clean energy plan. You know, in the book, we discovered how, you know, when you think about food, like John said, it's not about going vegan. It's just about eating less beef and lamb and cheese, which means you can enjoy a whole lot of other things, right? And so when you translate those individual actions to the collective ones, for anybody that maintains or runs a campus or an office building of sorts, switch that to clean energy. If you have a fleet of vehicles like those buses, get those uh, electrified. And then think about food waste and compost. Like, these things actually add up. And that's why when John asked the question, uh, who's optimistic about getting halfway there by 2030? I am, because those three actions are so accessible. The parts that still aren't, and we really need the higher education community to rise up, is around the innovations needed. Right? Think about advanced nuclear, new batteries, carbon removal technologies, hydrogen. These are all exciting frontiers. And maybe with, we've got two minutes left. On a, I want to ask John to leave us with a, with a thought, which is, John, you've called this opportunity underhyped. Why? Uh, in the early days of the Internet Revolution, I took a lot of flack for declaring that the Internet had been underhyped. I'm going to tell you today that the transition to a new clean economy has been underhyped, or at least under underappreciated. It's a mobilization similar to what we saw the West and allies successfully do in World War II. We stopped making automobiles and appliances for four years and created the weapons, the airplanes, the battleships that allowed us to see democracy survive. I am hopeful that you and other leaders in our society and world will find the means and make the commitment to push our society to show the way so that our kids who are angry. My daughter Mary, she's still angry. Get the world that we owe them. I want to thank everybody for sharing this time with us. You know, John's email address is john at speedandscale.com. Mine is ryan at speedandscale.com. 
We want to know what actions you are driving for in your communities, the collective ones. Please email us. I mean, this journey that we're all about to take together is going to take us this decade to get uh, to cut our missions in half, and we can't wait to do it with you. Thank you so much. Thank you.